Now that we understand a refrigeration cycle, let's apply some different conditions to that refrigeration cycle and see how it affects it. First one I want to talk about is going to be airflow, specifically the evaporator airflow. We need to be thinking that the heat is in the air. The heat we're trying to absorb is in the air. So if I have less airflow across my evaporator coil, I also have less heat across my evaporator coil. That's key for us to understand. So what are some examples, just a few examples that can cause an airflow issue? Well, the first one's gonna be a dirty filter. The filter gets dirty, we can't get enough airflow across that filter, and that's gonna be a problem. Not enough airflow across the filter means not enough airflow across the evaporator coil. But also, if we have a filter that's too restrictive. Now, high efficiency filters do have some air restrictions, but if they're designed correctly, you can have a large enough filter and it won't restrict airflow. However, if you use a highly restrictive air filter in a smaller area, it's going to be an airflow restriction. You're gonna have a pressure drop across that. And with that, you won't get enough air across the evaporator coil. So a dirty filter or restricted filter is one of the first things we look for. But also the blower. Remember that blower's moving the air. So what about if you have a blower that the motor's on the wrong speed? It's not moving enough airflow. Or maybe that blower wheel is dirty. And because that blower wheel's dirty, it can't move as much airflow. Or maybe the blower motor's going bad, or maybe it's the wrong size, or maybe it's not adjusted properly. All of these things would be not moving enough airflow across that evaporator coil. Also, let's look at a dirty evaporator coil. If that evaporator coil gets dirty, we're also blocking airflow, but at the same time, we're stopping heat transfer, slowing that heat transfer down. Dirt's a great insulator, and that insulator builds up on that evaporator coil, and we're not transferring the heat from the air to the cooler refrigerant like we need to. Ductwork is a big one. Let's think about the return air ductwork. If the ductwork is blocked, or if it's crushed, or if it's undersized, which happens all too often, but also the supplier duct system. If the supplier duct system's not sized correctly, maybe it's too small, maybe it's been crushed, all these things happen. Unfortunately, a lot of people know how to replace HVAC equipment, but not that many people understand the importance of duct work and airflow and how to size that correctly. Unfortunately, now you're ending up with a lot of homeowners that think bigger air conditioners better, and it's not, we'll get into that later, but they put in bigger air conditioners and you got HVAC companies just wanting to make more and more money. So the customer wants a bigger unit, they sell them a bigger unit and they don't care if it doesn't work well. So they put them a bigger air conditioner in and that not only is gonna cause lots of problems down the road, but it's also gonna be an issue for airflow. That old ductwork probably wasn't designed right for the existing system, and they have a larger system going in there, and it causes more airflow issues. And so now we're not able to transfer heat. All of this airflow is very important for a refrigeration cycle. Let's start to see how that's gonna affect it. When we started off, we talked about the heat being in the air. So we have less heat coming across this evaporator coil because we have less air, we end up with less heat across the evaporator coil. So that means the temperature around this evaporator coil starts to drop. And when the temperature on the outside of this evaporator coil starts to drop, the suction pressure inside drops. And we know that the suction pressure is directly attached to my suction saturated temperature, the boiling temperature, PSIG converted temperature. That also immediately drops. What happens when that drops below 32 degrees Fahrenheit? That's right, it will start to freeze. So anytime we see a system that's starting to freeze, my first thought is going to be airflow, airflow, airflow. Are we getting enough airflow across that evaporator coil? And we're looking at all of these different points. So now that my airflow is dropping, my suction pressure drops and my suction saturated temperature drops. If we look at that in a bigger scale, there's less heat acting on that. What that's doing is causing that pressure to drop, but also we're not boiling that refrigerant away as quickly. So now that we're not boiling that refrigerant away as fast, we end up with more and more liquid in that evaporator coil. So our saturated starts to flood. It starts to overfill that evaporator coil. By overfilling that evaporator coil, we're getting too much liquid, too much liquid vapor mixture in that evaporator coil. And we can't really measure that saturated, but what we can do is we can measure the superheated vapor. By measuring superheat, it's a sensible heat. By measuring the superheat, we can see that our superheat is too low. I got too little superheated vapor. So our superheated vapor is going to drop. By having too little superheated vapor, that means I have too much saturated liquid. So that means my evaporator coil is going to be flooded. It's gonna be overfilled with refrigerant. Also, let's look at some other scenarios that we're gonna see with that. Now that my suction temperature is dropping and dropping, the temperature difference, the TD between the boiling refrigerant and the air temperature is gonna get farther and farther apart. The air temperature is gonna be the same coming into it, but the suction saturated temperature, the boiling temperature, as it drops, it's gonna be much farther away. So our TD, our temperature difference, 
gets to be farther away. We'll see a higher TD. Let's say that our saturated temperature is 32 and the air temperature is 75. That's a very large temperature difference. In this case, it's going to cause it to freeze. Looking at that same scenario, let's talk about our evaporator delta T. Because we're moving air across it a whole lot less, a lot slower, we're going to have more time to take the heat out of the air. Because as the air is moving across it slower, there's more contact time between the air and the metal of that evaporator coil. So we're able to take a lot of heat out of that air. As we're able to take the heat out of the air, the temperature difference between the air coming in and the air coming out becomes significant. And that evaporator delta T is also going to increase. There's going to be a bigger difference between the air coming in versus the air coming out because the air is moving slower with heat out of the air. So that's what you're looking at on your suction side. These are the examples you're looking for. Now we talked about that being a flooded evaporator coil. That is key. After we flood the evaporator coil, it's possible to overfill it. And now we're getting liquid refrigerant coming back over here to our vapor pump. So we have liquid refrigerant coming to our vapor pump. Now we're ending up with slugging that compressor with liquid refrigerant. And that's very hard on the compressor itself. Multiple different ways. One is that liquid refrigerant starts to wash the oil away from the bearings. As we wash the oil away from the bearings, oil, no lubrication, moving parts, we end up with destroyed bearings, overheated and damaged bearings. Also that liquid refrigerant hits the insulation on the windings and it causes that insulation to start to break apart as that big temperature different hits and the windings will start to short out. Also, it causes the oil to start to foam. As the oil foams, when that's happening, we end up getting more and more oil into the compression side, as well as it's possible to get liquid refrigerant into the compression side. And we know that we cannot compress a liquid, so we're looking at breaking a valve on the compressor, or potentially breaking a valve on the compressor. The longer that it runs like this, the more and more damage it happens to the evaporator. Sometimes a lot of companies do not want to do evaporator coil cleans because after they put the correct evaporator in and the compressor is working back at full speed like it needs to, all those years and years of damage will do a number on that compressor. Not say it's going to happen all the time, but it is a possibility for that to happen. So when you start having airflow issues, you want to solve them right away because it's doing damage on that compressor or potentially doing damage on the compressor. Now the problem is you'll end up with a technician and he looks at only at the suction pressure and thinks, man, that suction pressure is low. If the suction pressure is low, we're going to be close to freezing. The problem is when somebody sees that, they don't think about it being a whole entire cycle. So what they do is in their mind is to get the suction pressure up. And instead of looking for airflow first, they'll go grab the tank of refrigerant. And what they do is they add more refrigerant to the system. Well, let's think about what more refrigerant is going to do to the system. More refrigerant means more molecules we're trying to compress. So what's that going to do to your head pressure? Head pressure is going to go up. And as our head pressure goes up, our saturated temperature is tied with that. So the saturated temperature is going to go up. It's going to be a much higher temperature. So now we have a higher temperature between the refrigerant condensing and the air temperature. So because our saturated temperature is going up, our condenser TD, also called a saturated temperature rise, also called condensing temperature over ambient, also called CTOA, all of that's going to go up as well because now I have a bigger temperature difference between refrigerant condensing and the air temperature. Now at the same time that we're having that happen, we also end up putting more liquid in the condenser. So we end up with more subcooled. So my subcooled liquid number starts to go up. So now instead of having my subcooling here, I'm trying to do my saturation in a much smaller spot. I end up flooding or overfilling with liquid refrigerant inside of my condenser. I stack too much liquid refrigerant. Because I stack too much liquid refrigerant, we end up with a flooded condensing unit. So they're trying to overcome these things by adding more refrigerant. Typically, you see your delta T will be approximately the same because we're still not moving any extra amount of heat. So our delta T for a condenser is going to be the same. But this is going to be the effects of when somebody's adding more refrigerant to it. So now we're adding more refrigerant. It's causing all this pressure to go up out here. And it's still making very little difference on the inside, depending on your metering device. Uh, we end up with still a low pressure inside. So what it do to your compression ratio? your compression ratio goes higher and puts more and more work on the compressor. So all of these conditions are happening. So instead of seeing low suction pressure and immediately adding refrigerant, stop, stop. Think about what's causing it. And airflow is your number one cause. Solve the airflow issue first. And soon enough, we'll get to how to check airflow. There's a lot that goes into that. It's going to be its own playlist by itself, but we're going to be covering that. But that's just simply how the low evaporator airflow will affect the system and a cause of what you'll see somebody doing on the outside trying to overcome that one scenario.